This morning, I want to talk about our personal journey. We all have a personal journey, don't we? Personal journey going on. I once heard someone say that the trouble with taking a walk, I see uh, Steve and Denise taking a walk every day. They come down the street and uh, the trouble with taking a walk is that uh, you don't know when you'll get there, right? For some people, the Christian life is that way, or maybe worse. Perhaps some might take a long view. I'm going to heaven someday, I hope, if I can hang on that long. Anybody have that experience? Don't show your hand. <laughs> Perhaps some people don't have a clear idea of what the Christian life is supposed to be. And if they have a slight inkling, they're not always sure how to get there. That comes up in my mind sometimes. Bible hope is not some kind of iffy optimism. That's not Christian hope. But we're looking for the blessed hope. And we should be filled with assurance. The Christian walk should be a walk of assurance. I would like to invite you to turn with me to 1 John. We read this in the Bible today the other night. I just love this passage. 1 John chapter 5. And uh, I want to look at verses 13 and 14. 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. These things have I written to you, that you believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know. What did I just say? That you may know, okay, that you have eternal life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the what? Say it really loud. This is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. <clears throat> the Christian life is not supposed to be a walk to nowhere or anywhere, but to somewhere. The Christian walk is a walk with a purpose that has a destination. And that's how we should conduct our, our, our business, right? A destination in mind. And there are signs along the way to know just how far we've gone. Although the Apostle Paul had a past, for him the Christian life wasn't about the past. Paul was always forward-looking. It's about the present and the future. You know, we always, we always live in the present. Did you know that? <laughs> Tomorrow, it'll be the present, right? We always live in the, we, cannot, we can't outrun the present. But the Christian life is also forward-looking, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I would like to read about Paul here, Paul's experience in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And verses 13 and 14. I see the pages turning. I'd like for us all to see. This is, the, this is the Apostle Paul. Verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was forward-looking. The Christian will be forward-looking. You know, we only walk in the direction that we're looking. The popular, popular modality to, to solve problems is by looking back. The truth is that we can't really benefit that, that way. Um, <clears throat> The instruction in the Bible is, remember Lot's wife. What did she do? Look back. Some pay more attention about how to get out of trouble than how to stay out of trouble. It may that be because we sometimes see ourselves as losers, maybe, or victims, rather than winners. Could it be that some have not experienced a new birth? We go to God with enormous amount of baggage, I can speak from personal experience here, and I've talked to some of you, and you have had these experiences. Some come with an enormous amount of baggage, and instead of having baggage in the past, leaving the baggage in the past, we sort of hang on to it. 
and collect more along the way as we, as we move along. Can't live that way. The Christian life is not supposed to be a junkyard where we scrounge around for used things from the past. Parts and pieces to get our lives back together again. Rather, for Christians, it's a new start spiritually every day. I've said this a lot of times from this desk. I like I just love the love the way it sit, way it sounds. Give yourself to God in the morning. Make that your very first work. And then spend some time opening God's word and learning to know Jesus. That's really the reason we need to we need to study the Bible, right? Isn't that our need? To know Jesus. Uh, there's perhaps a lot of people know about Jesus, uh, but uh, to know him. A new start every day. Also, we, may, we must acknowledge that when a person is, is um, born again, he can't change the spouse. Did you, have you ever experienced that? Maybe sometime or a lot. Some of you may have. You can't change the spouse. When you're born again, right? And you have a new life and you're looking forward and you're, and you're happy. And uh, you can't change the spouse or the children or the government or, or any other thing or any earthly thing. We absolutely cannot change people. And uh, much of our frustration revolves around that. But the change will only be in the one who is born again. May that be so with everybody here today. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be what? Born again, born again. And uh, trouble will still come. But in the genuine new birth, God gives us tools to handle the trials. Let's read a promise, a couple of them. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. <clears throat> there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is what? God is faithful. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of es to escape, that you may be able to bear it. And then another one I like really well, and that's found in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. You've all heard this. These are not new to us. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Wow, what instruction and what promise. The first step is to give ourselves to Jesus. The second step is to call on the Holy Spirit to bring to us the gift of repentance. How many of us, don't, don't show your hand, but how many of us believe that we need repentance in our heart today? <laughs> wow. Do you know, in the spirit of prophecy, it says that with every advanced step, our repentance will what? Deepen. Our repentance will deepen. And the closer we come to Christ, the more faulty will we appear in our own eyes, right? Uh, the spirit brings to us the gift of repentance. Let's look at it. It's a gift because it says the Holy Spirit gives it to us. If he gives it to us, it's a gift, right? Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Acts chapter 5, verse 31. This is a, a precious idea. Acts 5, verse 31. Here's what it says. Him, that means Jesus, has God exalted with his right hand, to be a prince and a savior, for the forgiveness, for, for to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. He gives us repentance. It's a gift that we, we can't conjure up repentance in our heart. He gives it to us. The first work of the Spirit is a call to repentance. John 16 is all about that. Sometime in the Sabbath afternoon, you might want to read John, the 16th chapter. It talks about the Spirit. In fact, 14, 15, and 16. Those three chapters in John are tremendous chapters on, on, uh, on the Holy Spirit. 
He's our comforter. He's our teacher. He's the one that leads us into righteousness. He brings conviction to our hearts uh, just when we need it. We still remain with the same problems we had before we came to Jesus and to faith. We might even end up worse than before we came to Jesus if we'll not take the time to do this every day. You remember the father and mother of Jesus, Joseph and Mary, they lost him one day. They were down in Jerusalem. And uh, how many days did it take to find him again? Don't lose your hold in Jesus. Three days later, they found him. And uh, we must not let that happen to us. That sets us back three days. We're forward-looking, right? Uh, Jesus said we must be born again. And the birth pain, you know, there's birth pain, right? The birth pain is repentance. And repentance is an ongoing reality. Pray for a repentant heart. With every advanced step, our repentance will deepen. We hear a lot about having a relationship with Jesus. But a person who is born again has more than a relationship. That person also has a commitment. We might call it surrender. Surrendering ourselves to Jesus. Lord, I give up. I can't do this. That's what, that, that's what, that's what a repentant heart looks like. A connection like the vine and the branches in John 15. A commitment is a relationship, but a relationship is not necessarily a, commi a commitment. In this life, we have all kinds of relationships, but not many commitments. Commitment is, in reality, a surrender. I give up. Self dies. There's a new me, a miracle new birth. Self dies and a new life begins. And what we need to do is when a new life begins, the death to the old and life to the, to the future, what we need to do is believe it happened. Believe it. There's a text about that. It's found in, uh, in John. I'm sorry, it's not John. It's Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, verse 11, I'm sorry. Just happened to think about this one. This is an important one. It says, likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Reckon it. What does that mean? Believe it. Believe that the miracle took place in your heart. We shouldn't go through life wondering if we're in Christ or out of Christ or wherever we're at. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I would like to read a text to you that tells us what commitment really looks like. It's found in Luke 22, verse 42. Luke 22, verse 42. This is what commitment looks like. Luke 22, 42. You'll recognize this as being the experience of Jesus. Luke 22, verse 42. He's telling disciples in verse 40, Pray that you enter not into temptation. Verse 41, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's commitment, isn't it? That's what the commitment that Jesus had on our behalf. Jesus is the forerunner of our faith. He's been the, on the way before us. He's... Uh, had a, had a journey. The bottom line of all this is the fruit called obedience. In order to bear fruit, we need need more need, need more than just a relationship. We need a commitment to the Lord Jesus every day. John fifteen one to five. This one is a very special passage. Uh, some of this uh, you might want to think about 
uh, committing to memory. <clears throat> John chapter 15, 1 to 5. By the way, this is a good place to talk about it. Tonight at 6 o'clock, there's going to be a very special meeting in the BLC. I would like to invite you to all come. It's about how to not have Alzheimer's, right? A prevention for Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, the older I get, the more I, I worry about that. There's a seminar going on every Saturday night at 6 o'clock, every Sabbath evening in the BLC across the parking lot, and it's very, very well done. I would encourage you to all come. It's about committing to memory, how to memorize things, about the value of committing things to memory from the God's Word. John 15, verses 1 to 5. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. That is, he prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. The Bible talks about having the mind of Christ in Philippians. This is how we have the mind of Christ, spending some time every day, studying God's word, page by page, verse by verse. And when you come run across a verse that you, you say, wow, I could use that in a Bible study. I could share that with somebody. Jot it down. Find out what... Um, Jot down where, where it was found. You can start that way and then begin to memorize that verse. It's, uh, it's something that you can share. It'll always be with you, and you can share it. The life of faith is doing what God asks us to do because faith brings a strong love for Jesus. And if we have a, if we have a love for Jesus, Jesus once said in, in John 14, 15, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Faith brings a strong love for Jesus. That's how we love for Jesus, right? And it comes through the word. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. People in athletics take seriously what the coach says. Uh, some have said and reasoned that as long as I'm sincere, it doesn't matter in the realms of faith and morals. My way or your way or any way, as long as I'm sincere. But winners in athletics are not only sincere, but they're committed. One day will come, one day will come from the verdict of the judgment. It's found in Revelation 22, 11. You know, all judgments have a verdict at the end, right? A judgment is in session today in the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary. And Jesus is our high priest. And none soon, none know how soon, it comes to the, to the names of the living generation, right? Judgment of the living. And here's the verdict that will be rendered. It's found in Revelation chapter 22, Verse 11, Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. And here's what it says. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be, what does it say? Righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Verdict of the judgment. The judgment of the living is, is um, you know, Probably sooner than we think. Uh, soon, none know how soon it will come to the names in the living generation. And uh, so for that time, we want to be ready. It will be seen if we have a connection with Jesus and if our commitment is strong. While we are aware that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. We must not be presumptuous here. There's a mindset that doesn't want to hear about repentance because it makes me feel guilty. Yet one of the worst, one of the first works of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. When we're convicted of a sin, what do we feel like? We feel guilty, right? 
Many see guilt as the cause of all our problems, so they go to counselors to remove the guilt. A quick, quick fix that short circuits the gospel. Now, I'm not discouraging Christian counseling, but if that counsel does not lead us ultimately to the foot of the cross, then little benefit will permanently come. That's the value of Christian counseling. There may be some counselors here today who have had training in that. And um, Christian counselors will lead people to Jesus. That's where it is. Pathological mental problems or demon possession are no doubt exceptions here. There are those things too. The real solution is to repent. Repentance is godly sorrow, turning away from known sin, remembering that repentance is a gift, right? We can't conjure it up on our own. We have to ask for it. Jesus said you don't receive because you don't what? Ask. That causes the guilt, uh, <clears throat> turning away from known sin, the sin that causes the guilt in the first place. Repentance is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and we should seek after it. Willful sin. What about willful sin? Willful sin is, what do we call that? We, we decide we're going to sin, right? It's willful sin. What do we call that? Rebellion. High-handed rebellion. Uh, willful sin is rebellion. If not repented of, it, it can cause a person to be lost. There's a text in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Please turn to me. I'd like to have us see this one. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. I don't know if I'm the only one that's tempted this way. But willful sin, this is a, a, a terrible thing. Hebrews 10, verse 26. He sa it says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. That doesn't mean that we're lost. But it means, it means that we do need to have a turnaround, right? And come to Jesus. Because willful sin is, is caustic. And uh, it may cause the eternal life of some people. So, uh, there are choices we make every day. On the other hand, the born-again Christian will not avoid the importance of guilt. Guilt to the spiritual nature is what pain is to the physical nature. When you have pain someplace, uh, what, is it, what does it do for you? It's a warning that something's wrong, right? Guilt to the spiritual nature is like that. It tells us something's wrong. Guilt lets us know that there's a spiritual problem to be repented of. Sometimes in my past experience, of something I've done or something I've said, makes me feel really bad inside. I can hardly wait to go to that person or, or make a correction in my life, whatever, whatever it takes, and say, Lord, please forgive me. And when the Holy Spirit brings the gift of repentance, there will be a deep and miraculous desire to love righteousness and hate sin. Uh, you know, that's in the original promise that was made to Adam and Eve right after the fall. The de Satan was there in that, in that, in that uh, covenant. And it says that, though, well, let's read it. It's uh, Genesis 3.15, that very first promise. The very first covenant promise, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We won't take a lot of time explaining this verse. This is a, a not, a, not an easy verse in some way to understand, but notice what it does say here. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head, and it shall bruise his heel. To the believer in Jesus, there will be an enmity developed toward sin. That's a miracle, isn't it? An enmity toward her sin. Of Jesus it said, I think this is in Hebrews 1 9, it says that Jesus loved righteousness and hated sin. That's what he wants for us. That's something that can happen and will happen with every in the heart of every true believer. The Bible says sins will not have dominion over us. Guilt is here to tell me in a very real way that I missed the mark. Now I realize that there is such a thing as toxic guilt. Some of you have heard of that, toxic guilt, which comes as a result of consistently grieving and turning away the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. That can bring a guilt that's very, very difficult to get rid of. Don't let that happen. 
When the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, we need to listen and uh, not turn away from Holy Spirit's promptings. This can lead to what we understand as the unpardonable sin, constantly turning away from the Holy Spirit when we when he says to us, this is the way, walk in it. And such is the guilt unto death. The antidote for toxic guilt is to turn to God through his word and prayer immediately. And the Bible says, while it is today, not tomorrow, we don't even have a promise of tomorrow. We always live in the want, in the present. <laughs> tomorrow will be the present. Meditating on the Bible truth is not a work, but a walk with Jesus. And that walk leads to heaven. And I'm so glad that, ge that guilt keeps us on track. It's kept me on track a lot of different times. And um, <clears throat> let us value guilt and heed his warnings. If we'll do this, we won't hurt nearly as much as we often do. The Bible says there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in, in Christ Jesus. No condemnation? That's a legal idea. That's a word from the law courts. It's, it's the feeling of guilt that sends me to my knees. And if we consist, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to read three texts here in a row. Uh, the first one is, uh, is found in Matthew 18, verse 4. Matthew 18, verse 4. Matthew 18, verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is the, who can complete that? The same as the greatest in heaven. Wow. Let's look at another one. Matthew 23, verse 12. Matthew 23, verse 12, just a little ways to the right. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. He that Humbled himself shall be what? Exalted. You know, we look at this word humble. It has an Old Testament idea in the sanctuary service. It says that those who prepared for the Day of Atonement afflicted their souls. That's what humbling is. That's what humble means. It's, a, it's what we just read here in this verse. Let's look at another one. This one is James 4, 6 to 10. James 4, 6 to 10. Somebody might say, well, I don't like James. James makes me feel guilty. Praise the Lord. <laughs> James 4, 6 to 10. But he gives more grace. Jim, he gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to, the, to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will do what? Lift you up. Wow. Such important counsel for end-time Christians. The Christian life of humility is the way we grow. Affliction of soul. With each advanced step, our repentance will deepen. And the closer we come to Christ, the more faulty we appear in our own eyes. When we appear faulty in our own eyes, what does that cause us to do? Flee to Jesus, right? Uh, <clears throat> the law is our schoolmaster to do what? Lead us to Christ. The law points out our sin. And so the law is our schoolmaster. It leads us to Christ. Repentance is a softening of the heart to God and toward our fellow humans. You know, we need to have a soft heart for everybody, don't we? You know, we don't have any enemies. We don't have any human enemies. Now, some people might, uh, like they've told Jim and I, get out of here. <laughs> They're not saying that to us, really, literally. They're saying that to Jesus, right? 
We don't have any human image. We go and we, and we spread the gospel around the neighborhoods. And uh, so uh, that comes from a softening heart toward God and toward our fellow beings. Pray for that gift always. Pray for a soft heart toward God. You know, of Jesus, you find this in Desire of Ages, of Jesus, it said, Jesus did not contend for his rights. Often his way was made unnecessarily severe because he was willing and uncomplaining. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus was a doormat, right? It means that as far as he himself personally was concerned, he had no enemies. They could do whatever they wanted to him. They finally nailed him on a cross. When, he did, when we do see divinity flashing through humanity, we see him driving out the money changers because they were making, making the temple a place of trading and, and desecrating the Father's house, right? But for himself, he had a soft heart toward everybody. And uh, nothing will humble the heart as much as a joyful contemplation of the grace and love of God in that wonderful experience that we call justification. I'm going to ask a question, but don't raise your hand or not. How many of you are justified believers? It means that you have been declared righteous before the law. Justification is a word from the law courts. It means that you have been judged righteous before the law. And God looks at you as though you had never sinned. He puts that covering over us. And under that rainbow of covering, we have the privilege of, being, of growing more and more like Jesus every day, right? What a motivation to serve God. He first says you're fully righteous. If somebody asks you, are you fully sinlessly righteous? <laughs> and we just shrink away and we say, no, no, I'm not there yet. The reality, we ought to very courageously say, yes, in Jesus, I have a perfect righteousness, for he never sinned. He always had a soft heart toward his father and toward those people around him. And he gives that to me as a gift. He looks at me as though I had talked like he talked, spoke as he spoke, treated others like he treated others. That's how he looks at us. And we need not worry about what the father thinks about us, but what the father thinks about Christ, our substitute. And uh, so we're all justified believers, hopefully. Pray every morning that you might have your sins forgiven. That's really what justification is. A contemplation of the grace and love of God in justification will humble the glory of man in the dust. That comes in our 1888 message. This is why truly justified believers will be praiseful and obedient. Well, coming down to the end here. Our scripture reading this morning, 29 of Jeremiah, verse 13. It says, you shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with what? All of your heart. You know, in Hebrews 4, I think it's verse 4, it says, you have not yet resisted unto blood. Jesus was victorious because he did resist unto blood, right? Drops of blood came out of his forehead as he, as he thought about us and the thought about the ordeal he was about to go through the next day. He says, you haven't resisted unto blood yet. You'll find that in Hebrews 12, verse 4, I think it is. Heaven is for winners. All who run the race can win. I see races. Some of them come straggling at the, in at the end. They're not winners, are they? They don't get the blue ribbon or the, or the uh, red ribbon or whatever. But in the Christian race, all of us are winners. Why are we winners? Because Jesus is victorious over the devil. All about him. The Bible says, two different places in Matthew, Matthew 10, verse 26, and Matthew 24, 13, he that endureth to the end will be what? Saved. The Bible says, here's the patience of the saints. 
Here they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Literally translated, this is how this is translated. Here is the steadfast endurance of the holy ones. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Patience in the Bible means endurance, the enduring ones. They're the patient ones. They take it as it comes, and they realize that Jesus is their righteousness. Don't become weary in well-doing. We must be reminded that the new life in Christ must be nourished with food and breath. Breath is the, prayer is the breath of the soul, right? It must be nourished with love. The newborn baby does not mature in a day. Make it a commitment to spend some time every day in the word. Give yourself to God in the morning. Make that your very first work. That's not just a platitude, my friends. That's the secret of a victorious Christian life. And God will richly bless. Today we've talked about the sanctified life, but the justified life is about hanging on. We want to realize that this life of faith is never alone. Faith is never alone. It's always, it's always accompanied by obedience. Uh, by faith, Noah, what did he do? Build an ark, right? By faith, Abraham, what did he do? He left his countrymen and went to a new place that he didn't know before. So <clears throat> our closing uh, text today, I'd like to have you all turn to it, and uh, then we'll sing our, our beautiful closing hymn. This text is Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 10. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 10. And then I want to drop down 19 to 22. E um, Ephesians 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 to 10. Here's what it says. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So this is not by works, but we're created to something, from our sinful lives to good works. That's the fruit. We're talking about fruit here. This is not the cause of our salvation, the good works. They are the result of our salvation. And then if we drop down to verses uh, 19 to 22, it says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the first chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows to a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. What do you think Adventist preachers should be talking about in the pulpit these days? <laughs> We're living in the hour of God's judgment. Jesus is our high priest, and the sanctuary in heaven is the object the place where our prayers ascend to. And I'll tell you what, spend some time with those prayers ascending. The Holy Spirit will make those prayers beautiful in the sight of God. And you'll have an experience that you never realized before. Dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you again for the graciousness that you have toward us, for the soft heart that you have toward us, that you don't think evil of us, but that you continually woo us to your heavenly sanctuary and that we're connected with you through prayer, Lord. Please put in our heart deep desires to know you better, to spend time every day, to give ourselves to you, to have a commitment that all athletes must have in this race that we're running. I pray that you'll be with everyone here today according to our several needs. 
And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.